We'll go ahead and get started on at uh, day three of Space 2013. I hope that everyone has found the conversations and the presentations that you've seen uh, useful and highly informative. I, like I mentioned yesterday, I've, I've really enjoyed them and I'm looking forward to today. Please remember to tweet or check for our Facebook, our Flickr uh, links and uh, increase the level of engagement there. But that's another way we can all communicate. I'm going to start off this morning as we have the other two mornings and inter introduce uh, Dr. Jeff Puchel from Raytheon, who's our recognition chair, to come up and present the award for this morning. Thanks very, <clears throat> thanks very much, Sandy. I have the pleasure this morning of presenting two awards. Uh, the first is to the Orbital Express Flight Operations Team for recovery from a post-launch anomaly which almost resulted in loss of the mission and then successfully completed the prime mission objective, uh, resulting in becoming the first to perform an automated rendezvous, docking, and servicing mission. Accepting the award are Rob Friend from Boeing Defense Space and Security, Colonel Fred Kennedy, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Air Force, Robbins Air Force Base, and also receiving the award but not able to be here today is Robert Rubens from Boeing Advanced Space Systems. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating these award winners. certificates for you as well. And we'll get your picture taken. Oh, okay. You can do that. Okay, so there, these are, we should be identical, actually. All right, I got you. Yeah, so very good. Very cool. Thank yep. you very much. Hey, you're welcome. Yeah. Pleasure. Appreciate it. And, uh, Getting it done up without you. Yeah, all right. All right. And so, so we should hold these up and, uh, yeah. that's right. Do our thing. Thank you very Thank much. You Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yep. Those, yeah, go ahead and take your cases. Because I know you've got a slide. So. Thanks so much, sir. <clears throat> Let's congratulate them again. Uh, the second award is for the best paper in space architecture. Uh, the title of that paper is Mock Ups 101 code and standard research for space habitat analogs. And the, the winner is Mark Cohen from Palo Alto, California. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating him. And now I'll turn the podium back over to Sandy. Thanks very much. So if today is said to have a theme, it's a lot, it's about space technology and uh, si earth science and, and space weather kind of use. And we're gonna start that off this morning with our plenary which is uh, aligning technology roadmaps to support space goals. And this is a panel that will bring together community stakeholders for a discussion around technology roadmaps and how various initiatives across the government and industry can align to support science, exploration, and defense. Technologies that are critical to enabling their future directions will be identified and we'll have some discussions about emerging technologies that could impact the way we approach development and exploration of space and that will also be part of the conversation. So if the panel would 
Uh, I'd like to invite the panel up and then I'll introduce uh, Carissa Christensen, our moderator, as they're getting seated. So I think uh, this is going to be a great conversation. And Carissa Christensen, uh, our moderator this morning, is a founder and managing partner of the Tari Group. And for 25 years, she's been a recognized expert in commercial space, engaging in the leading edge of the space industry with an innovative analysis of space systems, industry economics, advanced technologies, and the unique regulatory requirements uh, and the demand for those. She she's, has ongoing work with government agencies, industry organizations, launch firms, and satellite manufacturers and operators to help decision makers better understand the market of positioning and the future demand for space services and their, their dynamics. She has extensive publications, and uh, that includes peer-reviewed journals, industry publications, books, and conference proceedings, and is quoted often from those publications. She has a Master's of Public Policy from Harvard, Kennedy School of Government, and she has specialized in science and technology. And so, Carissa, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Sandy. <clears throat> I would like to welcome you to this panel, um, Aligning Technology Roadmaps to Support Goals, which is a very low-key title for a very exciting topic. The purpose of this panel is to talk about the remarkable technologies that drive every space activity. <clears throat> and the real, the, the, the particular purpose of this panel is to talk about the complex process of figuring out how to use limited budgets and where to invest them, how to predict where those technologies are going to go, so there's a big fortune telling component here, uh, in order to maximize the benefit to the nation, in order to be able to do as much in space as we possibly can. We're extremely fortunate today to have uh, four people on our panel who are driving decisions for the nation in this area. So the structure of our panel is uh, each of the panelists will provide an initial, uh, some initial remarks. They'll talk a little bit about their organization. They'll talk about some of the extraordinary technologies in their technology portfolio. And they'll talk a little bit about how they go about road mapping and planning and managing that portfolio. Uh, and then we'll uh, leave a good a bit of time for questions. This is a panel of leaders. The value of this panel is to hear uh, their responses to one another and to your questions. So please be um, energetic in providing questions to us. And I have a couple that I'm going to ask as well. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, introduce the uh, panelists and um, uh, one by one, but let me give you a sense of the scope of our panel. Uh, the panel ranges from uh, uh, Pam Melroy uh, at, Dar uh, at DARPA, uh, who is, brings the perspective of a space technology user. She is a test pilot and an astronaut combined with a technology developer. Mike Gazarek from NASA, who is uh, helping to redefine how NASA thinks about its approach to technology and its execution of technology programs. Uh, Neil McCasland, uh, recently retired from running uh, the uh, Air Force Research Laboratory at uh, uh, Wright-Patterson, uh, running perhaps a, a, a massive technology development machine for the Air Force, and uh, uh, Kim Washington, uh, who's at Lockheed Martin, who is the vice president of their Advanced Technology Center, and who will help us understand how uh, industry maps innovation to the bottom line, as well as to meeting national needs. So that's our panel. We cover a, a tremendous scope um, from uh, uh, near-term to very far-term technology development, and we'll hear from each one of them. And first, we're going to hear from uh, Pam Melroy. Um, uh, Pam Melroy, uh, uh, retired Colonel Melroy, uh, was an astronaut Air Force test pilot. She has a background in physics and astronomy. She piloted two shuttle missions. She commanded a third. Uh, she has been involved in some of the most important uh, human spaceflight activities uh, in, in uh, the last uh, couple of decades. She uh, helped to investigate the loss of Columbia. She was involved as a, in a, a leadership role at FAA in uh, starting to develop regulatory pro approaches for human spaceflight. And she's managed hardware programs at NASA and in industry. So she combines the perspective of the true end user of the most advanced space and aeronautics technology with that of a technology developer in her role at DARPA, and so uh, I'm pleased to turn the podium over to Pam Melroy. Okay, thank you. All right, 
Great. Good morning. It's my very great pleasure to be here today uh, to talk about how DARPA aligns uh, our technology goals uh, with the organization. Next chart, please. I have to introduce DARPA uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it. Let's see, do we have a... There it is. Can I go back one? There we go. So DARPA was, um, shares a history with NASA, actually, uh, was uh, formed by President Eisenhower after Sputnik. And the mission is to prevent and to create strategic surprise. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting organization. Uh, we have the luxury of trying to create the future. Um, uh, we don't have to be restricted to existing requirements. We can think about the way technology should be looking in five to 20 years. Uh -oh. There we go. So some of the history of DARPA, just to uh, kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about, uh, some very um, interesting technologies that DARPA has developed throughout the years. Sputnik, of course, launched in uh, 1957. Um, and uh, less than 10 years later, the Saturn uh, F-1 rocket engine, stealth. Um, ARPANET, of course, was the precursor to the internet. Global Positioning System, Global Hawk, um, MEMS, all pioneered by DARPA. Inside DARPA, we have five technical offices that cover a, a range of types of technologies. Uh, there is a, quite about a bit of overlap, but roughly, if you look from um, uh, left to right on the chart, uh, the Defense Sciences Office tends to work uh, very fundamental sciences uh, that don't necessarily um, have an immediate need yet, but just uh, trying to figure out the fundamental basis of, of science. Uh, information innovation, which works on uh, software. Uh, Microsystems Technology Office, who of course uh, pioneered um, MEMS. Uh, STO is the Strategic Technology Office. They tend to work on uh, systems and subsystems across the whole electronic spectrum. And then the Tactical Technology Office. And our office is the platform office. We develop uh, platform capabilities, uh, ground, maritime, air, and space systems. So most of the space demonstrations uh, come out of the Tactical Technology Office, including Orbital Express, which um, Colonel Kennedy um, was a program manager at DARPA uh, that just received the award. So we start out by taking a look at uh, a snapshot of where space is. Dr. Brad Towsley is the office director of TTO. I'm the deputy. We both started in January. And we took a step back and, and looked at where we think we are in space. Um, obviously, uh, space, as has often been said, is um, increasingly congested and contested and competitive. Uh, what's interesting is it's not just congested from the standpoint of the, the number of uh, operators, but also competition for spectrum as well. At the same time, we have tremendous cost challenges. Uh, the amount of time that it takes uh, for development cycles of new prototypes and new operational capabilities is radically increasing, which of course drives up the cost. We have a high cost of labor in this country and increasing life cycle cost. So looking across this, what is the state of the art, uh, you might say, well, you know, this is, this, is, uh, this is getting too hard to do. But of course, we can't say that because we all rely on space. I think everyone in this audience understands how important space is to national security and our economy. We don't have the luxury of backing away from it. We have to figure out how to solve this problem. So what's DARPA uh, all about? Well, I've talked about our mission of creating and preventing strategic surprise. Part of the the way that we do that is we actually try to create the future. We try to develop technologies so that we can direct uh, future outcomes so that we are not surprised by the way the world is developing. What we're looking for in our programs are big wins. We do not do evolutionary capability. 10, 20, 30 percent incremental improvement over current capability is not of interest to us. We're looking for uh, radical and disruptive changes. A big focus for us now is to drive cost effectiveness. And uh, we, we talk about upending the cost equation. And uh, part of that has to do with uh, national security. 
it makes a lot of sense to develop capabilities that are inexpensive uh, to maintain, but very expensive to counter. We're also looking at the business case for the Department of Defense as well. We're looking for flexible systems that can be used in a variety of ways. In fact, a lot of the technology that DARPA has developed has not been used in the way it was originally envisioned. For example, ARPANET was originally envisioned as a way to have secure communications with the loss of telephone signals. So maybe you could use com computers to communicate to each other. Obviously, we use the internet in very different ways now. We also look for rapid and agile developmental execution. Uh, we have a high turnover rate by, by practice and by definition. Our program managers typically stay uh, three, four, maybe five years at the most, and we're looking for programs that can be executed in that period of time. We're about demonstrations. It's not enough to just experiment. You have to actually prove it. We are currently focusing on uh, leveraging uh, unmanned capabilities, um, human and uh, autonomous interfaces, we also have to focus on the use of our technology. So in order to do that, we have to partner with uh, the service, all the services, to try to help to under them to understand how they could use our technology. And one very, very important thing that DARPA does is we try to cross the seams. One of the things that's hardest to get funded anywhere is something that everyone needs, because each organization will only fund its own requirements. So if we can cross the seams and uh, work on technologies that everyone benefits from, that's a very important part of our mission. So what is our strategy map for space? Our uh, primary uh, perspective is to protect critical assets. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. We're also very, very focused on the cost challenges. We think that that is a way that we can uh, help both the department, but also NASA and commercial industry. And finally, we also leverage key DARPA technology subsystem advances. One of the interesting uh, things about being in tactical technology office is that many of the other offices view us as their transition partner. So if DSO has developed a m new material or Stowe has developed a new subsystem, they d transition it to us to use on a platform. We're also extremely clear on what we're not focused on. And that's largely because other offices inside DARPA are focused on them. So we're not looking at cyber tools, counter weapons of mass destruction. We're not working on pre uh, uh, precision uh, pointing, uh, I'm sorry, uh, positioning, navigation, and timing. And we're not working on comms. So let me drill down a little bit and talk about protecting critical assets. I think uh, it is very, very interesting to have the discussion about orbital debris and about uh, planetary defense and, and a lot of those uh, comments, but the, the problem is that it's, it's easy to focus on the technology in the middle, which is what do you do about those things. The problem is if you can't find the threat, it doesn't matter if you can do anything about it. And so we are very, very committed to space situational awareness. And our uh, flagship program in that area is the Space Surveillance Telescope. It's an advanced capability uh, for broad area, very rapid search, very faint objects. Uh, we have uh, demonstrated that in New Mexico, and we are in the process of transitioning uh, SST to the Air Force and moving it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Attacking the cost equation, we're looking at that from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, Phoenix is a very novel program with a lot of revolutionary technology to repurpose uh, assets, uh, specifically apertures in geo. But the other piece of it is to have a satellite, uh, which is sort of a, um, you know, a, a fundamental uh, element of making Phoenix work. There have been several papers on Phoenix. Dave Barnhart's the program manager, so I won't go too much into detail. But the idea is to upend the cost equation by allowing rapid reconstitution using these uh, sat satellites that can be assembled on orbit and repurposing uh, apertures. The other aspect of the cost equation, of course, is launch. So we have two programs right now that are focused on that. One I think everyone is uh, probably fairly familiar with, the ALASA program aiming to uh, enable access to space 
on a 24-hour call-up tactical kind of timeline. But the experimental space plane is a program that we're about to kick off. Uh, we will be having um, uh, an industry day sometime in early Octo October to talk about it. And it, it, essentially, it's a reusable first stage technology. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So here's the problem. The problem is access to space. We all know how expensive space ha has gotten. Uh, DOD payloads, uh, huge amounts of money spent to uh, safely launch them in space. And we do have some smaller capabilities, such as Minotaur, but there's still no surge capability. And there's long call-up times for integration. So in this era of declining budgets and the desire to do rapid reconstitution, and also, at the same time, an increasing focus on smaller satellite capability. It's really extraordinary what people are able to pack into uh, 100 to 400 pound packages. So we'd like to enable that. Alasa has a goal of providing affordable and routine reliable access to space, $1 million, including range costs, to LEO. 24 hour call up and uh, optimal closed loop ascent guidance. So a lot of uh, very interesting technologies. And we'd like to uh, take advantage of some of those technologies and integrate those as LASA will hopefully demonstrate in 2015 to 2016. We will be ready to fold particularly some of those range capabilities into our experimental space plane. And the goal there is to enable routine access in a larger payload class, looking uh, more at the 1,000 uh, to 4,000 pound class, and uh, shoot for uh, $5 million a pop. So the goals of the program uh, are to fly 10 times in 10 days and to achieve Mach 10. So it'll be suborbital. This is not a single stage to orbit. This is a, a suborbital uh, hypersonic vehicle that will also allow us to do advanced hyperso uh, hypersonics testing, we think, as well. And of course, we're going to launch uh, a payload to orbit. So what is next? What are the things that we are thinking about in the future? So these are the programs that we're focused on today. But DARPA is a projects agency, and we are continually evolving. The things that we see in the future that we need to start thinking about now and developing programs in the next year or two, looking at infrastructure beyond LEO and GEO. We think space traffic control is the next logical step after space sp situational awareness. We want to look at technologies that will enable that. We think it's very, very important, ultimately, that our warfighters get their information uh, from all domains without needing to know where it came from. Did it come from a UAV? Did it come from a satellite passing overhead? Did it get passed from the warfighter next to them? They shouldn't have to know where it came from. They shouldn't have to do anything different to get it. All of those things should be seamless. And finally, we also think that civilian uh, accessible space is going to be something that is going to transform the future. And we're, we're looking at how we can develop technologies to enable that as well. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Pam. <clears throat> Our next speaker, so uh, uh, Pam talked about a technology portfolio that's very focused on disruptive technologies. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mike Gazarek, who is the uh, Associate Administrator for the Techno Space Technology Mission Directorate at NASA. His portfolio uh, uh, is uh, very broad in terms of uh, incremental versus uh, uh, very ambitious technologies. He's going to talk, about, uh, talk to us about that. To give you a little background on Mike, he is a PhD engineer. He's worked uh, at all stages of the technology life cycle, uh, from design through deployment uh, on all types of space flight systems in his work at NASA, which um, has been at headquarters and also at um, NASA Langley. He's put in hands-on time developing research instruments at MIT, software and uh, firmware in industry. Uh, Mike really understands the technology process from end to end uh, in different environments and to meet different types of goals. And uh, I can attest to that personally. Uh, we've worked with Mike and um, he's, uh, he's extraordinarily capable. Uh, and he can help us understand how NASA is approaching technology development through this new technology mission directorate. So please help me welcome Mike Gazarek.
Well, good morning, and it's, it's great to be here. Um, just I have a few remarks, and then uh, just to kind of break it up a little bit, I just have a two-minute video uh, to talk a little bit about our technologies and, and maybe uh, talking about a, a, some favorite destination of what, what those technologies uh, could enable. So l let, me, uh, let me just put that teaser out there, and, and, and then you got to sit through just a couple of minutes of remarks um, before the fun. Uh, so standing up an independent technology organization at NASA, for, for many of you, of, of you who have been around NASA for some time, and, and by looking at some of the hair color, I can see that that's, that's true in this room, um, like it is for me, you have seen this movie before about a standalone technology organization. Um, so why now? Um, and so setting up the sta Space Technology Mission Directorate, uh, Charlie Bolden announced it in February of this year. Uh, we have been running for about two years prior to that. Um, but why now? Well, if you look at where the agency is headed, um, it's, it's a, about going beyond low Earth orbit, right? It's about going into deep space. And to do that, we need a couple of things, right? We all know that. We know we need a heavy lift rocket. We're building that. We need a human rated capsule. We're building that. And then we need a whole host of technologies to be able to thrive in space. Um, we have reports on what technologies we need. We have a lot of reports. We have about 40 reports, at least that I have in my office, so done over the past 20 years. By many of you probably in this room have contributed to those at one point in time or another in the past two decades. So we know what we need to develop. Um, because of the focus of the agency, 30 years of the shuttle operation, completing the International Space Station, incredible achievements. Um, but but you know, the, the amount of, uh, of technology development um, ha has been lean. And so we need, we need to step that up, and that's really what the mission directorate is all about building a community inside and outside of NASA, developing the technology that we need to solve the problems that we have. We have many difficult problems to operate in space. We'll talk about some of those. Menu, again, that we know what they are. Propulsion, power, energy storage, communication, signaling, navigation, life support, uh, uh, you know, landing on another planetary surface, entry, descent, and landing, to, to name a few. So, so we know what, they, what, what those challenges are, and the other part of this is, is the who. Um, reaching out to academia, reaching out to universities, getting the brightest minds that we have in addition to industry to go work on our problems. That's what space tech really is about, is about building that community, working on the problems that we have both for NASA and, and as a nation. Part of our char charter in space technology is not only developing the technologies we need for deep space, but also for those that are applicable to the Americans, uh, the nation's aerospace industry. Things such as uh, green propellant, the replacement of hydrazine, uh, and uh, laser communications, applicable both to NASA as well as the communications industry in this country. Development of composite materials, large-scale composites, uh, a, a whole host of technologies that are broadly applicable not only to NASA, and our customers, the Human Exploration Mission Directorate, the Science Mission Directorate, but also the entire industrial uh, uh, co community and capability of the nation. So that's what Space Technology Mission Directorate is about. We have nine programs that form uh, the Mission Directorate, nine programs that uh, span the TRL spectrum from one to about six or seven, uh, which, we, which we have, we hope, will be the last step for infusion into a mission or an application. We have technology with, with a purpose. It's technology to solve a problem. Um, we also have, uh, you know, the right amount, we think, uh, of low, low TRL, push technology. We don't know what the right amount is, but that gets to uh, kind of the, the whole topic of this panel. One of the first things that we did in setting up the mission directorate and looking at previous versions of standalone technology organizations at NASA, what is their average lifetime, how long do they last, and why is that, uh, to try to learn from history about wh why we can make this one sustainable and long-lasting. And we think, we think we've, you know, we've learned certainly a lot of lessons from the past. And one of which is the development of roadmaps. Um, investing in technology to ensure and, and, and reduce the probability that becomes a sandbox is, is to develop a framework. And so we turned to the National Research Council and developed a series of roadmaps. Our area is broken up into 14 technical areas, each of which have a roadmap. These roadmaps were done both started as a draft with internal and NASA. Over 200 or so folks worked on those roadmaps. We then turned them to the uh, National Research Council, which reached out to the community to develop the final set. 292 technologies across 14 areas. They prioritized those 292 into the top 83, uh, six or seven per technical area. And then they took those top 83 and broke them down into the top 16 to give priority and emphasis. And if you look at those technologies, again, they are what we, we already know from the many studies and reports, high power solar electric propulsion, 
the ability to store cryogenic fluids on orbit to transfer those fluids, optical communication, entry, descent, and landing, uh, avionics, high-performance computing, uh, all the challenges that we know we need in space, they're in there. And they provide the guidance and the framework for where do we make our investments. Um, you know, in this position, you get a lot of people come up and say, why aren't you investing in this technology? It's cool, and you know you will need it at some point in the future. If my only criteria for investment was it's cool and I need it in the future, I don't think I could be able to discern from any of the 292 technologies. Almost all of them, they're not all cool. Most are cool. Uh, it makes it difficult to invest. And so we have to have something beyond that, and that's where the roadmaps in the council help us prioritize our decisions for what we need to do, right, to go to the next step and make important decisions uh, with the limited resources we have. We've enjoyed incredible support um, from our stakeholders on the Hill. Space Tech is up and running now at uh, a little over $600 million, starting from zero just a couple years ago. It's an incredible, I think, support from the community in this austere budget time that we've been able to create and grow uh, a space technology program and budget. So with that, um, that's the importance of the roadmaps for us, the guidance they provide. Uh, we look at all our investments according to those roadmaps, and they help guide our investments across the entire portfolio, which I say spans the, the TRL spectrum, from university supports and grants all the way to in-space flight demonstrations. Um, we run the gamut, and, and we think that's an important part of the process. You know, we've learned from history that technology development is very nonlinear. It's discontinuous. If you look at the development of the laser or, or the transistor, if you look at the history of organizations such as Bell Labs, you can see that it's actually kind of hard to trace where things go and where they come. And we're doing some studies on that and looking at it. It's a very nonlinear process. So what we know is building that community, solving hard problems, and building that network, and, and leaps can occur in places that we otherwise couldn't predict. So with that, what I'd like to do is take a few minutes, uh, two minutes to sit back, and, and instead of me describing our technologies, here's a couple minute video cast in and going to you know, some of our favorite destinations, Mars, and what are the technologies needed to get there and what are we doing about them to the, at this point in time. So with that, if, I could, if you could run the video. By the mid-2030s, I believe we can send humans to orbit Mars and return them safely to Earth. And landing on Mars will follow. for some uncertain generation of the multiple graphics all going on at one time. When my kids looked at this, of course, they thought it was fine. But for, for some of us, it seems it, it's a bit much. But uh, it does try to capture all the technologies and some of the, some of the projects that we're working on today uh, that are kind of listed there in the chart and show some of the video. We're only developing the hardware today. We're testing it. We're flying it. Uh, part of Space Tech is about getting you know, out of the report stage and into the lab, getting, you know, this is part of the culture change that's come about at NASA, uh, getting folks back into the lab, building and testing and flying the hardware that we know we're going to need. And so you'll see some of that in some of the Im Im images that kind of kind of flash by there uh, in each screen. tremendous impact on our ability to get to Mars. In some cases, reducing the number of launches by a factor of two, or the amount of mass that we need to bring to Mars by over a half. Solar high power, solar edge propulsion in some architectures uh, has the same uh, type of benefit. 
I always like to end all my presentations, and, and including this video, with one key part that I never want to lose sight of, right? It's, it is, yes, it's about the technology, but at the end of the day, right, it's about the people doing the work. And again, we've seen this time and time again. It's the folks in the field, both inside and outside of NASA, who are building, testing, flying cables, uh, uh, and, and celebrating, you know, on incredible accomplishments uh, that we achieve along the way. So with that, uh, I thank you for your time and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Mike. Um, space technology just makes you cheerful. That was a great video. Uh, moving on now uh, to uh, uh, hear about a space technology development portfolio that is uh, uh, even broader and more uh, diverse. Um, and that is, we're going to hear from um, uh, Neil McCasland, the recently retired commander of the Air Force Research Laboratory at Wright-Patterson. Uh, I, since he has just retired or is in the process of retiring, instead of calling him General, which he's been called for about a decade, I will fall back on his other title of Dr. McCasland. He has a PhD in astronautical engineering. His job at ARL was massive. He managed a $2 billion S&T program and another $2 billion worth of research projects for clients. Um, he uh, was the head of a global, we ran, was in charge of a global workforce of more than 10,000 people and he was serving a very a broad array of uh, uh, Air Force and um, a broader DOD space technology, uh, broad technology needs, including space technology. Um, so I, I look forward to uh, hearing from uh, uh, General Dr. Neil McCasland about how such a massive undertaking can drive innovation and where that works and where it's a challenge. So please welcome Neil McCasland. Thanks uh, very much, Carissa. Uh, you know, I really appreciate the chance to get to follow um, uh, Pam and Mike here because I'd like to set some contrasts in, uh, uh, in focuses. Uh, and fundamentally, it stems from the, uh, the fact that the United States Air Force has assigned roles and missions that are enduring uh, and that we as a service laboratory running the services S&T program are focused on meeting the needs of our service. In kind of round numbers, the Department of Defense has about $12 billion to work with, or it's had about $12 billion to work with for S&T. And that's divided up roughly in half between what uh, OSD uh, drives and, and manages, a uh, major chunk uh, of, of which is DARPA's, and the other half is, is remanded to the services. So for a military department, which uh, is in round numbers responsible for about a quarter of the resources of the service, uh, of the department, we have about a sixth of the S&T resources, and this underscores the need for us as a service laboratory to, to concentrate the hardest on what our service asks of us in its enduring missions. So um, let's go with the next slide, please. What I'd like to do uh, is, is share with you a little of the road mapping that we have done in the, uh, the space and happens to be the nuclear uh, mission area. Uh, and this is, a, this is a road map that if any of you went to our uh, uh, dialogues with industry over the past month, either at Wright Pat or at Kirtland, you would have seen. Uh, and I want to just borrow it uh, straight from that because this is uh, uh, posted and, and available uh, for those of you who are in industry um, on the uh, Defense Innovation Marketplace portal that OSD works. Uh, and, uh, and I want to just uh, kind of stick, uh, stick to the theme that we've, uh, that we've published. Uh, here's a, a map of the uh, you know, roughly a third of a billion dollars of Air Force TOA that we had to work with uh, in the FY14 President's budget. Uh, and, and the way it's distributed over uh, about eight core technical competencies. Uh, and, and I'll just touch on a few of these and, and lead you through some of the, uh, uh, the internals here. But the, the rhetorical question that, that's at the heart of, of all of these investments and all of our planning uh, is this. And we ask this of our operators and we ask this of our developers. What is it of the, the choices that the industry can offer you today that you are the least satisfied with? Where are you dissatisfied with in terms of a value proposition with what industry can supply? And the answer to that gives us the insight for what we should do with 
these resources and what we should do about that. So it's a very much a, a demand-driven uh, investment strategy with, with Air Force TOA. Now, before I, before I, get, uh, before I leave that thread, um, you know, uh, we, we, we like disruptive technology. We, we actually are the largest executor of, uh, of DARPA programs. Uh, but the, but the, uh, in terms of deliberate planning, we plan our resources for the enduring missions and assigned tasks of the United States Air Force. So let me just step through a couple of these and show you, you know, some of the exciting uh, uh, internal visions uh, and uh, some of the opportunities that, uh, uh, that we're really excited about. So let's go with the next slide, please. Does this, does, this, does this have a trigger? Here we go. There we go. Perfect. Um, Broadly speaking, uh, uh, Air Force space missions uh, uh, touch on uh, uh, you know, all of the component technology uh, for spacecraft, uh, and we've had an enduring uh, objective of, of, of creating better value uh, in terms of power densities, uh, uh, power uh, uh, produced uh, in solar arrays, uh, thermal rejection, uh, kind of all of the nuts and bolts of uh, the internals of spacecraft. And you know, we, uh, we lay that out in, uh, in some time phase roadmaps uh, and some specific performance parameters that just put some markers in the ground uh, that let everybody know what we're kind of shooting for. Uh, and you know, the Air Force Research Laboratory is proud to have been an underwriting sponsor of uh, all of the multi-layer solar cells that are in use in industry today. It's just an enduring investment, uh, thermal rejection, both active and passive, uh, cryo coolers, um, uh, things like this. And you know, we have an exciting collaboration uh, with NASA and the NRO as uh, we uh, look for shared interests. And this is a place where, uh, again, um, suppliers and uh, innovators uh, have a chance to bring uh, a, a better value proposition to all of us, uh, and, and we'll look for opportunities to underwrite that. Um, space electronics is a special area, uh, of course, because, uh, you know, in round numbers, uh, the uh, $100 trillion world electronics industry uh, only has about 1% uh, market share is, is, is what we in defense draw on. And, and of that 1% market share, only about a percent of that is the space industry. So when you're a percent of a percent of a global industry, you don't actually get to drive commercial capital very much. Uh, and yet our space systems, of course, are uh, you know, critically dependent upon the ability to put high power processors uh, and uh, function specific, especially for us in the Air Force, uh, mixed signal uh, RF microwave circuitry uh, into, uh, into service. And so we have a, a substantial part of our investments uh, are in um, uh, the adaption of, of evolving microprocessor fabrication methods uh, to create space qualified processors as well as specialized mixed signal uh, components that we need, uh, especially for our secure comm mission. This is an area, by the way, where we have an active collaboration uh, with Mike's team and NASA in terms of next generation processor, and it's one that the game uh, just changes uh, year after year after year. We've learned in the department that owning our own dedicated processor lines, uh, dedicated fab lines, is, a, is a, uh, 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 um, an enduring capital bill uh, that we would like not to have to recapitalize, and so we're, we're eager to explore methods that allow us uh, to adapt the, um, uh, the methods that are evolving for fab of, of modern uh, uh, circuits into, uh, uh, into uh, uh, space qualified rad hard uh, and high rel uh, componentry. So this is just a vital area uh, of, of shared interest. Um, and we uh, anchor some roadmaps here uh, just in terms of specific goals and, and kind of time phase those. Um, Sandy mentioned today that uh, the theme uh, uh, today is also on uh, 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 space weather and, and the environment. Uh, we in the Air Force uh, want to know the space environment uh, to, for the same ends that, uh, you know, the, the Navy knows oceanography. We operate in space. We need to know the physics of it. Um, but more than that, uh, we need to know uh, the way the environment affects our ability to design and operate systems. Uh, and that's been an enduring line of research uh, in the Air Force uh, for a long time. The Air Force was a co-founder of the uh, National Solar Observatory down at uh, um, uh, Sunspot, New Mexico. Uh, we've been in this business for a long time. And kind of the exciting thing about the modern time is the, um, the evolution of, of the physics uh, models to a level to where we can actually start making functionally useful engineering and operational predictions over useful time horizons for the way space weather and the evolution of, uh, of, of solar phenomena will map into things that are very tangible in terms of, of on-orbit charging and in terms of of, of scintillation and uh, specific RF channel properties in the ionosphere. Uh, and that's uh, actually got some uh, prototype operational 
uh, packages that are, uh, uh, that are in use uh, today, and uh, we're really excited about uh, maturing those to, to turn uh, this kind of a of a, of a uh, astrophysics, uh, I'd call it an astrophysics science program, into things that uh, uh, military operators uh, can depend and rely upon. Um, Pam also mentioned launch. Um, you know, launch matters to us in the Air Force. Uh, and the big messages that the Air Force tell us uh, in terms of capitalization are that uh, we would like uh, to prepare for um, new engines for the ELV fleet. Uh, uh, to the degree to which we'll continue to operate those, and in particular to prepare for uh, the potential to develop a, a, a U.S.-based um, uh, ox-rich uh, um, uh, main engine that uh, you know, the U.S. industry has, has never produced. Uh, RD-180 is a magnificent engine, uh, but uh, you know, the policy implications of, of depending on that are, um, are things that concern us, and so uh, we're investing in the capacity for a U.S. engine program. And then in terms of on-orbit propulsion, there's some exciting, uh, uh, exciting work in, um, in both electric propulsion uh, and in um, uh, alternatives to the, uh, the environmental uh, hazards and the handling hazards for hydrazine, as well as uh, some mixed mode propulsion uh, for both electrical and chemical in an integrated uh, on-orbit uh, propulsion uh, system that permits you know, the toggling between uh, chemical-based high thrust modes and electrical-based uh, high-impulse modes, all in a, uh, a single integrated uh, system. So, uh, you know, these are just a few highlights uh, that are uh, on our on our goal uh, sheet uh, inside uh, the Air Force. Uh, collaboration is good. Uh, the space business is too big. Uh, we're spread off of thin. Uh, so, uh, you know, those of you who have opportunities and can see common ground uh, between uh, national security, commercial. Uh, and military applications, uh, we'd like to hear from you. And, and I'd like to return back to kind of that rhetorical question, the degree to which you have a vision for, uh, you know, a better product for the way uh, to, for, to, to implement assigned missions for the Air Force uh, and, uh, and, and to get that product as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a better value opportunity for the Air Force, you need uh, capital investment in terms of, uh, of research and S&T. Uh, you know, the Air Force S&T program and us in the laboratory are, uh, you know, who I'd like you to talk to, and that's what we're, uh, that's what we're in business about. So thanks for the chance to, uh, uh, to uh, briefly um, uh, uh, introduce that to all of you in this discussion. Thank you, Neil. Uh, and that was a fantastic setup for our final speaker, the uh, discussion of uh, uh, collaboration uh, and innovation occurring in industry. Uh, um, uh, Kim Washington uh, uh, is Vice President of the Advanced Technology Center at Lockheed Martin Space Systems. Lockheed Martin and many other companies in the industry, Lockheed Martin is going to serve as the emblem of this for us today is really at <clears throat> the pointy end of the spear in terms of implementation of many of the technology programs that we're, we're seeing and we're learning about, and also is a resource for innovation. And so uh, uh, Ken, who is a PhD nuclear engineer, uh, leads hundreds of people in developing new technology that will have the effect of setting Lockheed Martin apart and uh, acting as a differentiator and um, uh, using innovation for, uh, to meet the company's goals as well as the nation's goals. He and his team work in every aspect of space technology. I'm just going to read you a little bit of the list because it's an extraordinarily broad portfolio. Um, uh, space and astrophysics, phenomenology and sensors, optics and opto electro optics, telecom and photonics, guidance and nav, modeling and simulation, thermal sciences, advanced materials, nanotechnology, and laser radar. And with a particular uh, emphasis, a whole subsidiary focusing on um, uh, uh, developing uh, uh, laser uh, uh, space-related uh, comm systems. Um, so Ken uh, is building on, so he, he and his team work in these broad areas. Uh, Ken has, uh, uh, builds on uh, years of experience at Sandia National Laboratory. His final position there was chief information officer and he, he held many other roles. So I, I look forward to hearing him talk about A, the cool technologies, and B, how a company like Lockheed Martin fits into this ecosystem and helps to drive innovation. So please help me welcome Dr. Cam Washington. Thank you for that warm welcome and good morning everyone. One fine Saturday morning, my wife and I took a drive down to the quaint little coastal town of 
Pescadero, California to have a cup of coffee. But it was no normal drive. It was actually a ride. The wind was in our hair. We leaned around corners. We saw beautiful landscapes. We passed wildlife. And when we got there, we had our cup of coffee. But it wasn't about the destination. It was about how we got there. I tell you this story because when it comes to innovation and technology, we do that the way we took that ride. We do it with purpose. And we do it based on what we want to do, but we also approach it with a specific how. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the what we do and also how we do it when it comes to innovating with a purpose to reach a destination, but to do it in the right way to drive out cost and to differentiate us so that we can bring technological surprise and avoid technological surprise. <clears throat> I'd like to start with, a, um, with an overview of Lockheed Martin Corporation. And the reason I want to start with this is because this is a big part of the how. Uh, when it comes to technology, one of the ways we can bring our best to our customers, and by the way, I'm delighted to be on this panel because many of my customers are on this panel. One of the ways that we can bring the best to our customers is to leverage the full force of the corporation. We're a large corporation working in many technical domains, but the core technology base that brings aeronautics and our electronic systems and our missiles and fire controls organization are many of the same technical capabilities we need to bring innovations to space. So we've begun a dialogue across that enterprise led by our corporate chief technology officer, Dr. Ray Johnson. We call it our technology council, so we can leverage the full power of the corporation. And I participate in those activities. And that's a big part of the how we bring innovation with a purpose to our missions. That's a big part of our technology road mapping. The Advanced Technology Center resides within our space systems company. And we are a small line of business uh, doing contracted R&D work for government customers like NASA, Air Force Research Laboratory, DARPA, Naval Research uh, Laboratory, and so on and so forth. Uh, but we also serve our internal lines of business. So a big part of our technology road mapping and our approach is to understand the missions of our, of our broad space systems portfolio, which includes providing strategic missile deterrence and defense, going to space for civilian purposes, like what we've experienced for many of the last few days and videos about going to Mars and using the Orion program, and also our military space platforms, and last but not least, our commercial uh, uh, space and commercial ventures activities. Underpinning all of those lines of business is a core set of technologies that are developed, matured, and advanced at the Advanced Technology Center. So our technology road mapping begins with understanding that broad set of missions and then knitting it together to create a sense of what priorities we need to take in making our investments and putting our focus. The, um, the outcome is, uh, is something that looks kind of like this. I don't expect you to read this chart. I wanted to show it to you so you can get a sense that, that we dive deep when it comes to understanding what technology priorities need to be in place. As I mentioned, we start with aggregating those program and line of business requirements, and then we focus on delivering affordable standard products. Our engineering organization, uh, along in partnership with our technology group that I lead, work very closely with all of our lines of business to, to shake out um, uh, standard, to, to drive standardization into our systems and to retire obsolete, obsolescence. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, the technology that's going to be in place in, say, five to ten years is shaped by a, by a cycle of understanding those re requirements and then driving that into our investment strategy. I'm going to share with you a couple of examples. I'll start with uh, perhaps the, uh, the, the largest example in our enterprise, and that's the, uh, what we call the A2100 product line, which is our standard uh, standard bus for um, space vehicles. There are, more, there are 45 A2100 platforms flying on orbit today, and I wanted to share this with you because our roadmaps led us to a decision to make a technology update of this platform. And many of the technologies that I'm going to share with you over the next several charts uh, will make its way into this technology update. 
to bring lower cost, more standard, and more flexible solutions to our commercial satellite customers, and then that can be leveraged for more flexible, lower cost, more capable military applications, which is what we have done in the past, and we continue to do that in the future. As I mentioned, just like my, as you probably have guessed, my, our ride to Pescadero was done on one of my motorcycles. Uh, just like that ride was about the how, we do our technology investments like the A2100 technology update uh, with a focus on the how as well. A big part of that innovation how is using a model-based approach. Uh, we're leaning forward aggressively in terms of bringing virtual manufacturing and virtual uh, e engineering uh, to our engineering processes and practices. This is a, dra a way to take drastic amounts of costs and risk out of our processes by trying things in virtual space before we actually build them, testing tolerances before you make errors so that you can error-proof some of your designs and, 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 and approaches. We've made some significant investments in virtual environments so that we can make this a standard practice for all of our engineering solutions. I'm gonna shift to talk about technology road mapping a little bit, and then I'll, uh, then I'll uh, close, close my remarks. Uh, the technology road mapping is done in each of the eight portfolios shown here that were listed in my introduction. I don't have time to, t to give you the details of each of these eight, so I'm going to focus on to give you an example in four of them. But if you just take a moment and look at this, this, uh, this chart, you can get a sense that in order to bring technical capabilities and in the, in the, in the lean forward in terms of creating the future, uh, do some of the things like the, the previous speaker spoke about, you need to have a, a rich portfolio of a broad set of technologies ranging from optics and modeling and, and LIDAR and, and RF solutions and modeling and simulation, and we, and we focus on all of those. I'm going to give four examples in solar science or space weather, if you will. The second one is in phenomenology. Uh, that's the icon in the top left. Uh, and the third one will be in optics and EO. And the last one will be in advanced materials and nanosystems. So let me start with space science. The roadmap in space science is pretty straightforward. The purpose that behind our space science roadmap is to reach the destination of being able to predictively provide an understanding of, of space weather, the sun-earth connection, how the sun performs and acts and behaves, and how it affects us here on Earth, as well as uh, platforms that are in space. We've had a successful string of, of, of both payloads and, and uh, spacecraft in, in the area of providing assets on orbit that look at the sun and help us unravel the mysteries of the sun, the most recent of which is the IRIS program that was uh, a NASA program that we were the prime contractor for. And we uh, couldn't be more excited about the success of that, uh, the successful launch and now some really wonderful science that's gonna follow. Look forward to that. The second example is phenomenology. Phenomenology is just a big word for helping us understand and predict what sensors are able to see and do. We have in the past spent a significant amount of resources to develop scene generations so that we can predict what the sensors on orbit are telling us so we can interpret the data. Uh, one of the innovations in our roadmap that has transformed our ability to do this more cost effectively is to leverage commercial off-the-shelf software uh, and leverage an industry that has made significant inv investments and then build on top of that realistic physics. What you're looking at in this little video is uh, the most, one of the most recent products of that work. Uh, what we did in this example is we, we licensed a commercial computer gaming engine. The computer gaming industry invests billions of dollars in these technologies. What, what they lack is realistic physics. So we took that and added the realistic physics, therefore saving years of development time and bringing innovative visualization capabilities to scene rendering, cap the scene rendering mission needs. The second example I'll share with you, the next example is in optics. And the, the uh, innovation that I'd like to focus on is in the bottom left of this chart. Uh, you heard earlier that understanding space situational awareness is, an, is a critically important national need. 
Uh, and what we're trying to do here is invert the cost equation by doing space situation awareness effectively from the ground. Uh, thanks to a successful contract pursuit with the uh, DARPA program, uh, we are advancing our capability of doing ground-based space situational awareness using distributed optics interferometry. What you see in this picture is a facility that we built at our Santa Cruz location using three one-meter telescopes that do distributed optics and then interferometry on the back end with some very innovative software. Using this capability, we're able to image objects at geo. We have a goal to do that at 10 centimeter resolution. It's pretty amazing and at extreme low cost. <clears throat> we're also looking to invert the cost equation in optics by thinking about optics very differently. This is a, an, uh, a conceptual image of a concept we call spider, which basically takes the notion of doing optics and reinvents it. Instead of having a large mirror, what if you had multiple small lenslets on top of a, of a series or an array of 3D optical chips that are interconnected by an optical interconnect? Just like in the example of the commercial gaming engine, these optically interconnected 3D uh, compute chips are being advanced and matured by the high-performance computing community. We're leveraging that to, to build out this currently very low TRL concept but we believe it has the promise of inverting the cost equation of doing large optics at a very low cost uh, for future space missions. The last chart that I have is an example from our advanced materials and nanosystems portfolio. Our roadmap here, again, is bold, but it's fairly simple to, to describe. Uh, the bold vision here is eventually have the capability of the 3D print a satellite. And we're starting with applying and deploying state of the practice capabilities of 3D printing parts with single components. But we're going beyond that and looking at advanced materials and multi-point composition and multiple materials for 3D printing. And we're also investing in a number of other nano innov innovations like graphene, nano-based electronics. We've developed an innovation for doing soldering with nano-based copper and making nano cables and advanced plastics using nano and nano infused composites. So all of these add up to the, the s components that would be needed to be able to piece part together with a, uh, an automated solution, a full satellite at extreme low cost using advanced uh, manufacturing and 3D printing capabilities. It's a long way in the future, but we're starting along a roadmap with a vision to get there and an approach to get there based on a how, just like in my motorcycle ride, we know we have to use modeling and simulation. We know we have to use advanced technologies. And we know we have to leverage the advancements and investments from other industries. And we're doing that on all fronts. That concludes my remarks. And I look forward to the dialogue of the panel. Um, thank you very much, Ken. And uh, thank you, uh, members of the audience. We've gotten some great questions, and so I'm just going to leap into those. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, group several, and there are two in particular that I think uh, uh, we should uh, really start with as they speak to the topic of uh, uh, collaboration and coordination and integration among these technology efforts. So I'll, I'll read the questions because they're, they're um, uh, interestingly uh, phrased, and then uh, uh, so uh, one question is several speakers discussed propulsion developments, uh, uh, rocket RD, uh, AD replacement. Um, uh, for example, uh, how are the different agencies cooperating such that we're not spending money on parallel efforts? Money is tight, so it seems highly coordinated interagency collaboration is preferred. And then um, a, uh, so, so let's uh, uh, sort of address that to the whole panel. What is happening and what is working in terms of coordination among the technology development efforts of these organizations? And I'll be interested in everyone who's representing government agencies and also Ken, who probably has a very different <laughs> perspective. So. Uh, let, me, let 
me, uh, I'd like to at least add one thing to that. I think that's, a, first of all, uh, certainly in this budget environment, in almost any budget environment, really, uh, right, coordination and sharing, especially in common technical areas, right, we, we all have often common interests, especially from technology level. So I think that's, that's prudent. I, from, a, from a space tech mission director perspective, I'll say that uh, that is one of our focuses to start with. We have now uh, about 43 activities with 40 government agencies. Uh, totaling somewhere kind of hard to count, but about $50 million worth of, you know, combined effort across a variety of areas. And, and as uh, General Dr. McClanslin mentioned, you know, there are some cases where we're sharing money, right? We're, we, we have an identified common technology. We're pulling our money together to go make that investment. In other cases, you know, we're sharing rides, and I think that's at least for a space tech uh, perspective. Uh, you know, we, we really don't have the budget to pay for rides. Many have said that, you know, our symbol ought to be a hitchhiker symbol, right, because that's how we're getting to space. And so we, we, you see a lot of the combination of either somebody has a payload and somebody has a ride. And I think we have at least 13 of those right now uh, where we're, we're sharing rides. Okay, um, you know, let me, let me uh, jump in a little bit here. The, um, there are formal forums, uh, interagency forums uh, focused on space. Uh, 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 space Technology Council, for example, is, uh, is one that uh, has a long practice between um, uh, NASA, pr primarily between NASA, the NRO, uh, and the Air Force. Uh, and so, you know, the opportunities at the executive level uh, to find uh, ways to collaborate uh, exist. I, I think uh, the, the encouraging thing that I'd, I'd ask uh, and, and hope to, uh, to extend to, uh, to you and the audience is the degree to which you see uh, products that, uh, and, and vision for new products that you have that, that appear to be responsive and offer value to, to, to the disparate nature of commercial, military, um, national security, or civil space, uh, and, and you can see a case for that, you know, that's what we kind of like to hear about. Uh, be, because, uh, you know, I completely agree uh, um, uh, with, with, with Mike there. In today's budget environment, um, you know, you're, you're, you're heroes if you can uh, show a way for your agency that gets uh, further down the agency's goals by throwing in with someone, um, even if it brings some, some dependencies with you, than, than having to uh, chart your own course. Yeah, if I could add. I, thank you. If I could add something from an uh, industry point of view. Uh, there are really three ways that, that we're fostering that kind of collaboration that I would encourage more, more of that to occur for those who, who are in a position to, to enable it. The, the first is, is um, it's, it's very typical that we would approach a solution by reaching out and forging strategic partnerships with other agencies and, and uh, uh, what we call coopetition and uh, other institutions. Uh, in fact, the NASA centers uh, oftentimes partner with us to bring technology solutions to, to primary NASA missions. Uh, we've begun a, a very rich and fruitful dialogue with the, um, both the Goddard and the NASA Ames uh, centers and with the JPL center regarding how we can collaborate on the technology front to bring solutions that are synergistic to, to NASA missions. The second way is, is in partnerships with universities and other FFRDCs. Uh, what we find is when we do a home and home visit, we learn more about the mission space and the technology, uh, state of the technology um, uh, practice that brings value to our customers on both ends. So that's always a win-win when we do collaborative visits with other research institutions. Uh, and then the, la the last way is, it's perhaps not as obvious, but uh, as you could glean from the, the list of internal customers that I serve at Lockheed Martin, uh, the technology base in my organization is, is, is um, founded by, uh, up upon serving missions that span multiple government agencies. And so we, we, we do solutions for the intel community, we do solutions for DOD, and we do solutions for NASA, and we do solutions for commercial customers. All four of those have the benefit of of d having the collaboration and the sharing that happens on the back end at the laboratory. And, and that may not always be obvious, but I can assure you that that brings cost savings as well as innovations to each one of those four uh, mission areas and customer, customer communities.
Um, so DARPA is in a little bit of a different space with some of this because, um, first of all, the most important thing for us generally is to try to transition our um, technology. We are not operators. We uh, don't have a specific mission. So we're trying to find someone who will use our technology. And if you're talking about the Department of Defense and Space, then that's going to be NRO and the Air Force. So we are structured in a way that we uh, think about the transition of our technology from the very beginning of a program. And uh, we do a lot of partnerships with, uh, uh, with other agencies that are going to take our, our hardware or think that they might be interested. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as using them as our contracting officers. And that, that helps too because it puts, um, puts some of their personnel in the middle of it and understanding what it is we're trying to achieve. Sometimes it's bigger than that where money is being brought by both, both sides. So I, I think that collaboration is a, a very central part of what we're doing from the very beginning. Not always. Sometimes the things that we are doing are so disruptive that nobody wants to touch it. Um, but typically, once we engage with a potential transition partner, that's when we do find out if they're already doing things in those areas. And, that's, and, and if that's happening, it, it's normal for us to pull back because if somebody else is working in that area, we're not going to expend our resources. We're going to try to find something else to do that's uh, disruptive or beyond. Um, I will say that um, we have worked very successfully with NASA in the past. Orbital Express is a, a great example of that. And uh, currently, we have several partnerships where we are using subject matter experts on key programs uh, from, from NASA to, to help us. And, uh, and so I, I think we have more to go in that area, and we want to continue to work on that. Uh, but I think when it makes sense, um, we've been able to make it work. Yeah, and, I, and I'd just like to add, I, I think that's right, and Pam and I have talked about this before. You know, it's, it is a challenge, though, to work together, aligning interest, aligning budgets, and, and the speed of the organizations. I, I mean, I kind of, there's kind of an impedance mismatch sometimes. I'm not proud of this, but between NASA and DARPA, I, she moves fast. <laughs> and, uh, you know, NASA, we, 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 we like to take our time sometimes, and so we, 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 it's, it, it, it is a challenge. We've got to work hard yeah, to do it. Yeah. Uh, so, and in fact, I was going to follow up that question with the, um, there's clear commitment to cooperation and collaboration and, and uh, uh, shared use of, of scarce resources, but it's hard. It, and it, it often doesn't work. So, you know, Ken, do you, either of you want to offer any thoughts on what, think, when it doesn't work, what are, what are the challenges to that? Because I, I think that Mike's point is a really good one. Well, the, the, the times when it, when it's really when it's kind of in the too hard pile for us is when when we find that that the uh, tech base is is so overlapped that we end up in a competitive position mm -hmm. and and then it just doesn't work to collaborate mm -hmm. but but it's a healthy competition and that's kind of okay too it's good for the economy it's kind of how the country was built and so um, mm -hmm. we're okay with that as long as it's a fair playing field and it always is um, but it's, it's it doesn't always work as a collaboration I, I think with us in the Air Force, uh, you know, the, the kind of the structural advantage that we have to work with the planning is that we have clearly assigned roles, missions, tasks to accomplish uh, in space. Uh, and, and those are things that uh, give us a, a good analytic framework for, for what's responsive and what gives, provides value and what doesn't. Um, and so our, our challenge is to stretch a bit and say, well, uh, stare off into the fog of the future and ask ourselves, how could those missions evolve? And, and what's the likelihood of there being common ground uh, in, uh, in particular technical areas. So I, I'd argue with us uh, in, in the Air Force, uh, you know, the structure is a, is a, is a two-edged sword in terms of, uh, of, of an analytic framework and a discriminant. I would like to add one, one other area that, um, that makes it hard sometimes to, to partner uh, for us. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that happens that can be very frustrating has to do with the budgeting process. And so uh, if there is a, a fantastic technology and you've just done an amazing demo or at the end of phase one you begin to realize this thing is really much better than you even dared dream, uh, you're still two years out from getting a palm line. 
you know. So you have this this mismatch in that regard. This, you know, where where is your partner going to find the money? They might desperately want to, but they never saw it coming. You know, we're sort of rocketing in out of left field, and they have no idea what to do with that. So that's a, a challenge also. So uh, it is no surprise, uh, uh, given this audience and uh, what we care about, that uh, there are uh, several questions offering some thoughts to DARPA uh, on its uh, <laughs> advanced launch concepts program. And, and I'm going to kind of group them and give you a, an opportunity to, to note. One speaks to uh, the idea of covering the seams the, that a, a partially reusable launch vehicle has many uses. The suggestion that the first system, uh, not to try to get too much from it, maybe glide back from Mach 3, some alternative approach. Another question asks what the schedule is for the XS XS1 program, and uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, raises a, a, a point that I think is is uh, worth raising, which is and is phrased, how will you avoid the failures of past DARPA space access efforts? And it highlights Falcon, the not the SpaceX Falcon program, the suborbital Falcon program. And another um, speaks to the uh, limitations of you know, the airborne launch helps cost or drives costs down, but space is still limited by the rocket equation. What research is going on to develop a material uh, to, with the properties necessary to make a space elevator possible? So I'll, I'll in, originally direct that to you, and I'm sure others may have comments <laughs> okay, on advanced cool. launch technology. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was a handful of questions there. Um, so. I'll talk about XS1 for a couple of minutes. I, I do want to make sure that um, I say something which I did not say earlier, which is that the, the, the uh, schedule for that, first of all, is uh, we hope to have the broad agency announcement out sometime in the next month or so. Uh, there should be some more information on the web and Fed Biz Ops, and then we'll be doing an industry uh, day for proposers in early October. So we'll be able to talk through some of some of those things in the in the very near term. Some of the pictures that we showed, they're all artist concepts done by um, an internal uh, DARPA artist. And so we're not actually restricting the space to a winged or non-winged vehicle. Um, we, the key is that it needs to be a reusable first stage. As far as Mach 3 versus Mach 10, uh, one of the most important parts, I think probably all of us feel this way, of our job is to try to get out and talk to industry and talk to other technologists about what they're interested in. And I can tell you there are a lot of people out there interested in a Mach 3 kind of vehicle. And they're putting money and thought and time into it. And so for us, the goal is to go beyond that. We, we actually think that uh, getting to Mach 10 is um, uh, has is the is the bigger reach that DARPA is looking for. As far as uh, avoiding failures, I think one of the most important um, aspects of DARPA is that we're really not afraid of failing, and that's because we're not addressing a specific requirement for uh, any service. We don't do requirements. We we're not focused on that. That is what the labs are focused on: is uh, fulfilling technology requirements for uh, the services. So as a result, um, if we try a little bit too hard and fail, technically, we always learn something out of that. And we're not afraid to do that. I mean, the RAF doesn't come down on us because we haven't missed a requirement that someone has to have, and uh-oh, what's wrong? We're, we're actually uh, over, yes, I know. I know, it's a really great place to be in. So as, as far as failures go, we're, we're not actually afraid of that. We always learn new things and we try to build on those things and use those lessons learned going forward. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, I think we're going to do the very best that we can. The only tragedy in my mind is when we fail in a program because we didn't execute the program right. Mm -hmm. So either we wrote the contract wrong uh, or the performer thought they could do it but they can't and we didn't see it coming in some way. Uh, poor program management or execution, um, not good risk management, those kinds of things. That's bad. That's, that's not a good thing if, if those things are happening. But if we fail because of technology, that's, that's great. So uh, that's why we're, we're headed for the big step of Mach 10. So I think one, a part, one, one of the components of your question had to do with what materials are being uh, research that'll allow you to get there. And, but let me comment on the, the launch piece of it. 
Uh, I think all, all of industry has recognized that launch has been a, uh, has been a major technical challenge in, a, in an area ripe for innovation to invert the cost equation for a long time. And we've recognized that, and so we've been making some investments and some doing some thought leadership in that area for the last several years. So we're very excited to see the DARPA move forward with this with this opportunity. So look forward to that. On the materials front, um, I kind of glanced over uh, my uh, advanced materials chart because I was running out of time. But let me take this opportunity to talk about uh, talk about three things. The first is is an advanced material called APEX. It's an acronym stands for Advanced Plastics Engineered for the Extreme. And, and that's a material that, that is extremely low cost, can be actually injection molded. It's, 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 a, it's a Lockheed Martin invention. And it's stronger than replacement parts, and it's lower in cost. And so we think that's going to be a big part of our future in terms of inserting that into space platforms. The second is. Uh, I think we could we could never underestimate the the, the potential promise of of nanomaterials and what they bring for um, a high high um, high material uh, high temperature applications. So we're doing some uh, some uh, research in in nano diamond special coatings using nano uh, engineered materials and other things that are not yet ready to be talked about. And then the last thing I'll mention is um, we don't know what we don't know, it, but we the one thing we, we do know is that uh, this is an area that's ripe for innovation and investment. That's why I made the decision several years ago to bring together all of my material scientists into one organization I call the Advanced Materials and Nanosystems Group, and we, in, we invested in a, in a world-class facility that they're going to reside in, and we hope that that's going to bring uh, some focus to that area so that when these opportunities come forward, we'll be prepared to to lean forward and, and address them. Thank you. We just have a few minutes left, and so uh, I'm going to ask each panelist to give us their headline, um, because we really are about down to three or four minutes, their headline on what are the biggest challenges, either in terms of technology or in terms of process, with regard to technology road mapping that you see in the future for you and your organization. <laughs> You're going to put me in the hot seat. Okay. Okay. Um, I think uh, I think probably the biggest challenge, especially on the government side, uh, in industry, this is a much more obvious thing to do, and to apply that in the government can be very difficult. But in times of challenging budgets, uh, re to resist the temptation to peanut butter spread and starve every program that you have yeah. Yeah. and instead to, to really take a hard look at the ones that have the highest impact. Not necessarily the ones that are going to be, the, that have the lowest risk, uh, but the ones that have the potential for the highest impact and to adequately and fully resource those programs and let some of the other ideas go. And I think that's really, really hard, is to actually stop doing something. I think that's the biggest challenge uh, that we face in, that, in those kinds of strategic decisions. If you said it was important last year and then you stopped doing it, it, it feels funny. But in fact, it's, it's really the right thing to do. Yeah, I, I, we're uh, in space tech at NASA ab about to go off and do uh, and refresh our roadmaps that I mentioned earlier. So we'll be doing that. So we'll be we'll be freshly faced with the new challenges of developing efficiently a new set of roadmaps. And and I think um, you know there's some process challenges there, reaching out to the community, collecting a broad array of opinions, and, and that too gets to the point of uh, of trying to decide on on what's the next step in a particular technology area. And there's a lot of varied opinions out there, and, and especially when, when you're trying to compare low TRL ideas, uh, you know, space elevator and a few others that have, you know, you can see the tremendous benefit. But if you look, one of the things that we kind of do is, you know, look at the uh, kind of a watershed level. What, what what is the amount of investment it would take to get that to maturity? And you can kind of estimate that. And, and you know, for your size of your program, you can only take on so many things. If it's way, you know, if some of those demonstrations that would take 
to require it to mature technologies above and beyond your budget, then, then you, you, you know, there's not much you can do. You can try to move the needle forward as best you can uh, and, and try to do you know, the system study work. But I think that's the most difficult challenge, at least for us. Um, the early set of technologies to invest in weren't really hard, to be honest, because we haven't done so, we haven't done technology development for so long. Uh, they're there. Once we mature those, and if we do our job properly at Space Tech, it will get real hard on what to decide once we mature the things we have uh, in our plate right now. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, uh, in, uh, in, in my own view of uh, managing the uh, investments uh, for the Air Force's S&T programs, um, the, the, the single big, biggest challenge uh, that, that uh, uh, we faced is staring into the fog enough to, to make a reasoned guess as to when we would go through a uh, major configuration change and a, uh, uh, an evolution of a particular program. The Air Force's space programs are fairly stable and enduring. Uh, they do change, they do evolve, uh, but um, you know, the ability to predict when that will happen is, uh, uh, is, isn't terribly easy. The discussion about launch, for example, uh, it's, it's been understood uh, inside the Air Force that reusable, re a reusable first stage boost offers a better value proposition for a long time. We've thought through that for a long time. We actually deliberately thought through whether or not we would continue to invest in that, and the answer was no, because the horizon for that just seemed too far off for the Air Force to consider. Um, Another example, um, uh, the missile warning business today depends on, uh, uh, you know, you know Cibber is a program with, with, uh, with optical apertures that are on the order of about uh, uh, 20, 22 inches um, and the size weight that goes with that. Uh, we have demonstrated on orbit that comparable performance can come with uh, uh, mosaic solid state focal planes and apertures of about half that size and all the scaling goes with that. Uh, it offers a better value proposition. It's hard to predict the timing for when federal decision making will be ready for a transition like that. So we in the S&T business uh, uh, have to kind of gauge our bets about uh, uh, you know, how much time do we have in front of us uh, to achieve the sort of TRL maturation that uh, is important. And that's really what we spend the bulk of our time wrestling with in those, in those judgments. The two biggest, you know, the biggest challenge, and I'll actually share two, because uh, they're closely related. I, I think that uh, I'll start with uh, kind of where I began, which is innovation and technology development with a purpose. And that's the biggest challenge, is keeping your focus on what, what the purpose is. And, and what I mean by that is when, when a technology is, is being developed and it's being invested in and, and advanced, uh, it's a huge challenge to ensure and to have the discipline and to take on the risk of connecting it with a mission and getting it inserted into a product. Uh, because it's often difficult, it's, it's really hard to be the first adopter. Nobody wants to be the first to fly a nano thing, right? And so it's really hard to get something inserted into a mission. Uh, but if we don't find ways to transition technologies, we'll, we'll not move the needle long term. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And, and I think a corollary to that is we're, we're not as good of, uh, at communicating the impact and, and, and telling the story around why and how these technologies will make a difference and are going to make a difference and, and making it real and bringing it to life for those who are in decision-making positions, uh, whether you're talking about internal to an organization or external with a customer. I think we could do a much better job of that, or even with the public, getting the public to buy into why are you doing a uh, you know, particular mission, uh, building a sense of advocacy and support and enthusiasm around that. I, I think if we did a better job for that, it would really, uh, uh, at that, it would really help us in terms of getting technologies advanced, invested in, and then transitioned and inserted into mission so it can make a difference. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, AIAA for putting together this uh, remarkably good panel and uh, for the opportunity to moderate it. I've had a wonderful time. I would like to thank everyone in the audience for being here bright and early. Uh, and for your participation through questions and your attention and engagement. And most of all, I would like to thank our panelists for making this a marvelous start uh, to today's day of the conference. So please join me in thanking them. Also, just as a note, there's now a networking reception in the coffee break in the uh, exhibit.